your teacher, a great friend. I know you're going to enjoy. I want to give a warm welcome to Pastor Don McClure. Would you do that? <laughs> Well, good morning. Is this on? It's working. Well, it's exciting to be here. John and Lynn are such wonderful friends. And uh, Jean here yesterday, it was, uh, she had a wonderful time with all you ladies and looked like an awesome time. We came in. Uh, John and I didn't catch it, of course, but they weren't allowed. And, or I have food. They didn't feed us either. But anyway, the uh, men notice that. But uh, anyway, so wonderful to be here and to be able to hang out. And uh, uh, it's a joy. And again, through the years of just watching the way the Lord's blessed this ministry and the ministry outside and the community. And uh, well, it's a joy to be here. So this morning, if you would, and you have your Bible, turn with me to Joshua chapter 5. And uh, I want to look at Joshua as he's coming in to the promised land, coming into Canaan, and he is overlooking Jericho and the first really great battle of his life in many ways. He's coming. I'm going to pick it up at verse 13. And here, and here is Joshua looking at the city, evaluating how he's going to take it, how he's going to handle this. Uh, perhaps, you know, what's, what is he going to need, a kind of battering rams to break through the gates, or what, what would they need to try to get over the walls of this in, incredibly huge uh, and powerful city filled with warriors, and they weren't warriors, they were slaves, essentially, and then they'd been in the wilderness, and now as he's calculating, how are we really going to handle this, and no doubt, and it's weighing on him, but here, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and he looked. Behold, there was a man who stood over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went unto him and he said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Neither. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And he said unto him, What saith my Lord to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose off thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war. Go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear the ark of uh, seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, that when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall come down flat, and the people shall ascend up, every man straight before him. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you give us a time and a place. Lord, every week in the midst of this world that wants to drain us and exhaust us and confuse us and frustrate us. And Lord, you give us this time that you invite us to come in and sit down before you. Lord, to set everything else aside, to wait upon you. The one who, rather than draining us, wants to fill us wants to comfort us, wants to strengthen us, wants to speak to us, Lord, even about the events that go on in our life and the battles that we have. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of our hearts to quiet. Lord, to just kind of shut out all of these other things and realize you are worthy of our full attention. So speak to us, Lord. Strengthen us, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, we all live in a world of great spiritual warfare. It's always there, whether we know it or not. And, and everybody has, whether they know it or not, there's a Jericho. There's Jerichos everywhere, all the time, all around us, and, it, and battles and struggles. It may be what's going on sometimes in our home, our marriage, our family, our children, maybe our health, our finances, our career, our job, maybe the political environment or whatever. It doesn't really make any difference. These are battles. 
uh, there that happen in life. We, that, uh, on our way to heaven, on our way to where one day all the battles will cease. All of them will end, but God allows them. He puts these things in front of us because those are the ways that, and the events that he uses for us to grow. To really grow in him, to depend upon him more. And more and more, it seems like we don't naturally grow as much as we, we grow because God puts events around us that we need to cry out, God, I don't have the strength for this. I don't have the wisdom for this. I don't have whatever I need to solve this. Help me. Guide me. Uh, speak to me. And, and we need to, seem, need to seem to need some sort of battles, Jerichos around us. And God uses them. They come and they go. They're there for a time and then they, they pass. And here we look at Joshua here now as he's overlooking Jericho. And as I already alluded to, no doubt the greatest battle of his life and of his career. And, and here what is really going on when you kind of step back from it and you watch this the communication going back and forth between the Lord and Joshua, you know, you realize here, stepping back from it, that, that the battles in life really are, it isn't Jericho. It's a battle for the heart. God is using this and the Lord there to speak to Jericho and, uh, and to deal with his heart. It, the battles that we think, it isn't the marriage, it isn't the family, it isn't the children, it isn't our health, it isn't any of these other things. What is really going on through our life with all of these things that come and go, it's the heart. God is wanting to capture more and more and more territory of, in, in our soul, in our heart, in our life. And that's what maturity is in the Christian life. Somebody that has just gone through more Jerichos. Learn to grow in them. Learn to depend upon them. And here as we look at how do you take Jericho, what's the secret of it? What was it about this? And I think there's something here that's as common as every battle every, that anybody ever has that's always fundamental in it, and that is, is that the, the battle, as I said, is for the heart, and that the key of the heart is worship. It's worship. Here we have jo you know, uh, Joshua. We already know he's a man of great faith. That had been settled decades ago within his heart or within his life. Uh, Forty years earlier, he was, you know, part of 12 spies that went in, Joshua and Caleb. Ten of the spies, when they came in to spy out the land, the ten of them came back and said, oh, you know, we can't take it. Oh, it's a land of milk and honey, and there's wells we didn't dig, there's houses we didn't build, there's olive years and vineyards we didn't plant, and it's all there for us going for the taking instead of living out here in the wilderness with nothing. Oh, it's awesome, it's wonderful. They brought back grapes and fruit from the land, and they said, but we don't stand a chance. There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers. We're, they'll kill us. We'll be done for. Well, the people believe the evil report of the, of the ten. Though, and, but Joshua and Caleb said, that's true. All of that is true. They are bigger than we are. They are giants in the land. We are like grasshoppers. But we also saw the Lord. He'll get us through. He will give it to us. And, uh, and, and here, so Joshua and Caleb, he already saw the Lord. He saw God could get him through things. But the people decided, you know, there to believe the ten. And there they ended up hiding out in the wilderness they're turning back and just letting their life just drift nowhere for, for years. We're warned in the New Testament. Also, it's in Psalms as well. But in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says, you know, uh, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. In the day of the temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and saw me and saw my works. Yeah, and he says, but I swore my wrath. They will not enter into my rest. Here they saw God's power. They saw his work. They saw all he could do, but they still chose not to believe him. So God says, so I let their carcasses die in the wilderness. They didn't want to go into the land. They didn't want to take a step. They didn't want to fully trust me. I'm not going to force anybody into, into Canaan. I'm not going to force them into this, this life I have for them. They've got to want it. More than anything else, and, and that's the reward when somebody looks, and that's what they wanted. They didn't, though. But here, Joshua, now, you know, he was a man of great faith. He was a man who trusted. So what's going on here in this battle as he's looking at Jericho? It has nothing to do with his love for the Lord or his faith so much in his trust in the Lord. But now as he is facing, really, the battle of his life, and, uh, and it was an enemy, no doubt, he had been looking forward to for 40 years. Ever since he had been there and spied it out, all he wanted to do is, I want in the land, I want to go, I want to have it. And no doubt he'd thought about it and thought about it and run, you know, who knows how many thousands of times, you know, he's looking over there and dreaming of it. And someday, God promised me I'm going. But when and when? Well, now it's, it's happening. 
And here, though, but so on one hand, it, it, he had been thinking and dwelling on it, no doubt, for 40 years. But things have changed a bit. And, uh, and that is, is that now, essentially, the weight of the people stood square on his shoulders. And uh, all of now their lives, their homes, their marriages, their children, their future. Moses was dead. The weight of it had been on Moses. Joshua had been his chief servant there to him at his side and everything, and a great encourager and a great friend and right there with him all the way. But yet the weight of it always fallen upon Moses, and now there's a shift. He's no longer simply a friend and a counselor and an encourager. Now it's all shifted over to his shoulders, and, uh, and though the battle, you might say, hadn't changed, the task hadn't changed, the perspective had. And now he's having to deal with that. Here in a couple of weeks, I will have been married uh, 52 years. And, uh, and I'm still sharp enough I can remember getting married, which I'm quite excited about most of the time. But at any rate, I remember 1968, and very well, that year I was in a dozen weddings. It, just, it was a year, a bunch of my friends and family got married, and I was up and down the aisle, a groomsman and the best man and all these different things in various weddings. And actually, by the time it came to my own, which was December 22nd, I was almost bored with weddings. I would just like, you know, I had rented so many tucks, been through so many rehearsals, been through all of these other things, up and down the line. And I, you know, we'd had parties for the, ba you know, bachelor things and prayed and been together and rejoiced over all sorts of things. And, hey, you're going to be great. I'm so excited for you. And I'd been all up and down that line. But then when my wedding came, I just moved over just basically two feet from where I had stood before. <laughs> and somehow or another, that last two feet, it was, it was like the end of the plank or something there, you know, that you'd watch others take the walk and, hey, you're going to be fine, buddy. <laughs> now I'm walking the plank, you know, kind of. And now I'm out there. And I remember the doors opening there, the music and dum, dum, you know, or something. And as... Jean and her father, the door open, and here she is coming down, and tears are coming down my face. I look, her father, tears are coming down his face. You know, he's like, oh, what have I done giving my daughter to this guy? And I'm thinking, what have I done, to, you know, with this thing? It hit me like, you know, a ton of bricks. We had, it's just the, the night before. You know, and we'd had things, and I watched Jean give her credit cards back to her dad. I said, dude, dude, we don't have to do that now, do we? You know, and I mean, you're realizing this woman eats three meals a day. She needs a car. She needs gas. She needs, you know, food and clothing. She dentist and, you know, all this stuff, you know, their things. They, 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 they like clothes and shoes and all this unnecessary stuff in life, you know. And stuff. But here, it's coming to me, and all of a sudden, it kind of hits you. I had been I had the most awesome woman in the world, never regretted it for one moment, just simply it hit me. Just simply there, the and, and, I, and I remember there, you know, th that dimension. It was funny with our wedding, you know, they're planning it and the why, all the women are in it. And when they came, what do you want? All I wanted, I want chocolate cake. Now, if you were married a long time ago, you would remember back in the 60s, 70s, when, I don't, I, the, the cakes were the worst cakes on the planet. They were like cardboard. They were terrible cakes. I think they made them like 20 years before, you know, and every one of them was the same. Now they're pretty good, but I said, I want chocolate cake. You can't have chocolate cake. Yet yeah, you ask me what I want. That's it. I want chocolate cake. I'm tired of all these terrible cakes. I, and, and I want the woman. I want chocolate cake and the woman. That's it. The rest of it, you can do whatever you want. I got chocolate cake and the woman, and I was quite happy by the end of the day. But the, uh, the thing is, is that here, Joshua, it had now been shifted over to him. Now he is looking there, and it isn't where he's standing next to Moses, and, hey, I'm with you. you know, Sir, you're, you're the leader. I serve you, and I, and, I, and I love it, and whatever it is that God chose you, I'm in. And so here what is happening with Joshua, it's a very common thing. It happens to all of us all the time. And, uh, you know, I mean, most of us, I mean, you don't have to be around very long. You realize life is always getting more complicated. That's the way it progresses. That's the way it goes. There was, I mean, we all had simpler times in our life. We all had times there when, when life was so much easier, so much simpler. But the, as you grow, uh, th things change. Life gets more difficult. And... Uh, 
And that's what's happening here, you know, with, with Joshua. And uh, here Joshua, now things that he had agreed with, he had signed on to, that Moses said and he agreed with, and uh, everything he had parroted himself for 40 years. Now it's coming down to him, you agreed, you subscribed, you, you amended it, you were there with it, but now it's on you. He had been a great spy. He'd gone in there and came back and reported what he saw. And even at a time, it tells us in Exodus 17, it says, and then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephindim. And Moses spoke unto Joshua. He says, take out men tomorrow and you will fight in the valley. Aaron and her and I, we will go up to the mountain with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua, he's actually leading the army to go out there and fight with Amalek. But Moses and, jo uh, and Aaron and Hur are up in the mountain. And here Joshua, as he went out and he fought, but it didn't take long. When you look in the text, you realize it says, when Moses held the rod of God high, Israel prevailed. But when he was tired and the, and the rod was down, Amalek prevailed. And so it wasn't really how well Joshua, even what his strategy was, and how hard they fought if, they, if the rod was down. They were losing Aaron and her, you know, got on Moses' side. Both sides held up the rod, and they ended up winning the day. But even then, Joshua, though he was a warrior, and he was good at what he did in many ways, he, he realized even then God was honoring Moses. It was there where up on the mountain is where he still, Moses was there involved in so much. Well, now Moses is dead. Moses is gone. God has taken him home. And what was once so simple is, is, you know, is, is no, no longer so simple. What, what was once enough of God is no longer enough. That's life. That's on how God, what God has designed. What was once easy, what was once enough of him, the, the God has a way of always adding more weight to the barbell, so to speak. Once you kind of get something up, once you've grown things, life is a progression of never-ending growth, trust, dependence. And here is the burden you know, and grow the power and the presence of God has to grow with it. And here it's like, and when you look at this Joshua, uh, you know, he's, he's not just spying out the land there for somebody else. Now it's on him. Remember yourself, just so you didn't take, you know, just to stop and remember how simple life once was. But then you go, you get married, you had a husband, you had a wife. You add some children, maybe, you know, you go into business, you've got some partners, you've got, uh, you know, a mortgage there, <laughs> and you, you've got children, and you've got other people around you that depend upon you, and, and now you're not just going in to spy out something. Now you're leading them all in with you. Now the weight of it is there. I, re I remember very well, you know, but, but before life, before I was married, and uh, I grew up on the West Coast. And did some surfing, nothing like your pastor. But uh, I just got wet with the board and fell off it a lot. But at any rate, we, that's what you did. We did a lot of surfing. And somebody would call you, hey, the surf's up. You want to go? Yes, of course. Boom, and ten minutes later, you're out the door. You're off, you know, you know, with it. And then you get married. And then, you know, you've, you've got some children. You've got some rent. You've got yard work. Phone rings. Hey, surf's up. You want to go? Yeah. <laughs> when? You know, when? Well, now. You mean like today now? <laughs> yes. I said, are you kidding? I've got paperwork, requisition forms to fill out. I've got permission I've got to get. I've got to get somebody that will take the kids and somebody to mow the lawn. And I, I need two weeks. Give me notice there so I can, you know, kind of <laughs> get to today. That's life. That's how it is. What's, it was once so simple. How more complicated. The old simple prayers that seem to be sufficient. Now they go through far greater scrutiny. We, you know, we all remember maybe the little prayers there for a little child. You used to be able to see and think about, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. And this I pray my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, this I pray my soul to take. This wonderful little prayer that's so comforting and so sweet. So fine, but then, then you had a wife, you had a husband, children, a business, a job, or a loss of job, or you're upside down in the, the house, so you lose a job. There's a pandemic and a slug of other things going on, and somehow or another that prayer is no longer sufficient. There's no longer enough. There's, there's, now, now the prayer changes. It's actually shorter, but it changes. Now I lay me down to sleep. 
This I pray my, to- my soul to take. Now, anytime. I'm waiting. Guy can't handle this, you know, sort of a thing. I don't know what to do. And here you find yourself looking at the problems and somehow or another they outweigh the presence and the sufficiency of the Lord. And you don't hardly recognize him. That's what's happening to Joshua. Here he is. He's out there looking at the city and thinking about it. Weight of it's on, trying to figure a strategy. What am I going to do with, 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 with Jericho? And there, all of a sudden, there, there's the Lord before him, sword drawn in his hand, all ready to lead, all ready to go. This is with, with the man he's put in position, you know, to use to do it. And when he comes on the scene, the man doesn't even recognize him, doesn't even know for sure who he is. Doesn't know if he, I mean, here's somebody that had been such a friend, a companion. He'd raised up and he's putting, you know, leading Joshua, wants to do this. But, in this. but instead, all of a sudden, the Lord seems to have just, instead of the solution, he's, he's added to the problem. Joshua, he's startled. He steps back. He says, aren't that for us or for adversaries? Here's Joshua. He's worried. He's under pressure. He's distracted. Have you ever noticed when he gets stressed, everybody is like that? Are you for us or our adversaries? Who are, whose side do you want? Are you, for, are you for me or against me? Everybody's either there to help you or get out of the way. Leave me alone. If you're not here, part of the solution, you're just part of the problem, I can't, I can't handle it. And there is he standing before the Lord. <laughs> it's so, I love his response. I can almost just see the Lord there, sword drawn in his hand, ready to lead him, ready to do it. Instead of a man rejoicing, he said, oh, man, I didn't think I've been waiting for you. But uh, just sitting here, no, I can't go ahead without you. But here, no. But he's startled, and I love the Lord's answer. He's out the forest of our adversary, and he says, neither. But as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? What an answer. Joshua, the issue isn't am I for you, against you. I happen to be... Commander-in-chief of all the armed forces of heaven and earth. Joshua has nothing to do with them for you against you. Joshua, the issue is, are you with me? Are you with me, Joshua? Are you prepared there to just let the, what, what, what's really going on here and, uh, and hear that? This is what really, right here, this is so critical. This is what determines so much of our life. What happens when we find ourselves in the pressure and the dilemmas and all these things around us and we're almost, Lord, where are you? What's happening? How could you let this occur? How could it get so bad? I can't handle all of this. But here, you know, Joshua's there before him and what sayest thou? Immediately he's humbled. Immediately you see this this, there as he turns like, of course. And what sayest thou? What do you say? What do you want? Oh, do you realize how much the Lord loves to hear that when we're up against the wall? When the battles and the struggles in our life are there and instead of the pressure when he just stands there before us, instead of making accusations and how could you and where you've been and what's going on, that we could just say, what do you want to say to me? And here is order, simple, same thing he'd said to Moses 40 years earlier, Joshua. Take off your shoe, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. It's set apart. It's a place for you and a place for me. It's a place for our life and our struggles to take another step. You've been thinking and preparing for it, but it isn't Jericho. It's me. I want even more of you. The one there that's going to determine all the successes and there are the failures in his life, all the battles he's going to have here. Here's the secret of it. You learn this lesson here. You learn this here and now. Joshua, you'll have taken a major step forward in your life. There's going to be a lot more Jerichos before we're done. A lot more battles. A lot more that'll come from here and come from there. Oh, they'll have different names, different issues, different circumstances, but they're all the same. There's something I'm going to be putting in front of you again and again and again, the dilemmas of life, of which I'm the answer to every one of them. Joshua, give me your heart. Give me your love. Give me your adoration. See what happens. And here, the same thing that you would want from all of your generals. I want the same from you. I want you to trust me. 
And you know, Joshua was always a worshiper. He was always a worshiper. But what was enough? As I said earlier, it's no longer enough. There's more that God wants. That's, the, that's always true in all of our lives. None of us have arrived. Not one of us. I don't care how long any of us have known the Lord, how many battles we've been through, how many things have happened. None of us have arrived in heaven. None of us are complete. All of us still, as long as we, as we breathe, there'll be Jerichos. There'll be things around that'll happen and come there. And what was once sufficient before won't be sufficient again. It'll be more and more and more. That's God's design. More worship, deeper trust, greater sense of who God is growing within our lives. I love Paul in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 3.18, in the Amplified Version. He says, all we with an unveiled face continuing to behold, we reflect like mirrors the glory of the Lord and are changed from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here, you know, Paul says, with an unveiled face, Moses had a veil on his face, we can come right before the Lord. You can look right into his face, an unveiled face, continuing to behold, just looking straight at him, trusting him, continuing to behold, we reflect like mirrors the glory of the Lord and are changed from glory to glory to glory to glory. Unending change is always going on by the Spirit of the Lord. That, you know, when you look at somebody that you realize they've loved the Lord, walked with the Lord for decades, and you look at them and you say, they're a saint. <laughs> you know, there's somebody you look at them and they just, you, just, you realize they've been through so much. And you, just, you can just see the Lord on their face, and they smile at almost anything that comes their way. You wonder, how did that happen? How did they become that? Do you think they just one day decide, I want to be that person? No. That, they're that way because they had one Jericho after another. One battle, one struggle, one issue within, within their lives. They just didn't just one day just become, a quote, unquote, to us, this incredibly mature, godly, spiritual person. No. There is somebody that's something process by process, step by step. The same way anybody grows in any other career, any other thing that they do. And an athlete who just continues to grow, they may be great in, you know, I played a lot of things when I was in high school. I, I didn't do terribly, uh, I, I, but nobody in college wanted me. <laughs> I said, well, you might be okay there, but you, you, you don't make the grade for us. Oh, really? Yes, really. Step aside. You know, I mean, oh, and then people that make it in college. I had some great friends that went on and did phenomenal in college and, you know, won all sorts of awards. They got in there, you know, got signed on by the pros. Two of them, very good friends, signed on, you know, by the pros. They didn't make it through camp. They released them. And each time, if somebody continues to grow, I didn't, uh, it never ending. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, the man across the street, he was the coach for the Dodgers Farm Club. And I was a bat boy for him, and it was fun. And Sandy, I don't know, Sandy, do you, would you know West, Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, Don Sutton? They were all Hall, Hall of Famer. I'd warm them up, and, of course, I'm Sandy Koufax. I'd be, and, and for a day, that when we all played ball all the time, we b would pick one of their names, and we'd be them in our dream world. And none of us ever became, a, you know, highest I ever got was bat boy. But at any rate, but the thing is, you go, same with the Christian life. A lot of people. They're still there, they're, they're, they've been around maybe for many years, but they're still just a bad boy. They haven't grown. Nothing has happened with them where they found they faced the issues in their marriage or their life or their, their crises and gone and sat before God and looked into his face. Lord, you must get me through this. You must help me. And they know what it is to take the shoe off the foot and just bow down before him in the dust. And here, that, that's what worship is. That's what worship is all about. We all know the story of Abraham and Isaac. When, here Abraham, when he started in his journey with God, you know, he, he struggled at times with his faith. God, well, you know, wanted to bless him, and he ends up going down to Egypt and tries to handle it himself, and he went back and forth and struggled, but he continued to grow. He continued through the years and years and decades go on, and finally after Abraham had walked with the Lord for 50 years, he'd grown this incredible way where one day the Lord comes to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, I want to ask you something, and well, sure what? Abraham, take now thine son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him as a sacrifice unto me and Moriah and the place that I will show thee thereof. 
I want your son. Will you trust me? And Abraham did. He takes his son, and there they're on the way, and Abraham there just, what is it that God wants? He had come to trust him so much, and there he was willing to sacrifice. Hebrews 11 says that he even before resurrection was even known or considered in the history of man, it says there that he knew that God was able to raise him from the dead. And so he knew, all right, if I'll do what it is you want. But on their way up there, the story happens where here Isaac turned to his father and he says, Father, and he says, yes, my son. And he says, well, we have the fire and we have the wood. Where is the sacrifice? One of the things that everybody in the Old Testament knew is that you, 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 fire and wood you know, were, were part of it, but the, but the centerpiece of worship was a sacrifice. Where is the offering? Where is the sacrifice? Worship, unless something died, no worship happened. Unless something was offered up, no worship transpired. I wonder how many times we come into church. Sometimes in church, boy, we got great fire and great wood. Hey, we can really strike up the band. We can have great music, great songs. The words are all up there. We're all singing them together. Sometimes, you know, our head is tilted, our eyes are closed, maybe a hand is raised. But I wonder how many times the Lord would look and say, well, I see the fire and the wood. Oh, nice song service. Where's the offering? What's being sacrificed of your heart, of your life? What is being put on the altar? What is why have you come here today to worship me? If you don't want less of yourself and more of me, what are we doing here? What's it all about? And here it ought to be that each time we come because we realize I will never have given all. Never, this side of heaven, but all the way through life, he's wanting to collect a little more and a little more and a little more. Like John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. The word altar in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, they would, they would never worship. They couldn't worship without building an altar. Sometimes it was only a few stones stacked up, but they would worship required an altar. And all the word altar essentially means in Hebrew is slaughter place. You could, didn't worship unless something was slaughtered. Something was put to death. And like, you know, the Bible tells us to reckon the old man dead. And when we find ourselves, Lord, something must die in me. Something must go. Something of my arrogance, my pride, my behavior, my nature. That's what God always wants within us. Loose off thy shoe for the place whereon thou standest. But then the second thing, that is the, the, the second part of this that is so critical to success, to growth, to taking Jericho. We're told in, uh, in verse 14, oh, well, we'll pick it up in chapter 6, verse 3. Hereafter, he's there, he's, he's bowed down, he's taken the shoe off, and he's worshipped him. Then there, the Lord speaks to Joshua, and he gives him very clear orders. Chapter 6, verse 3, he says, And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go about the city once. Thus shall thou do six days. The seven priests shall bear the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day, you shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and uh, ye uh, hear the sound of the trumpet, all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall come down, and the people uh, fall down flat, and the people shall ascend seven times. Now Joshua there is on his face. Joshua is what sayest thou? He's offered himself. He's there. He's afresh. They're, they're on the right terms, and now here's your marching orders. You want Jericho? Seven times. Ye shall, ye shall, ye shall, ye shall, ye shall, ye shall, ye shall. Here's very, it wasn't just some sort of just unclear sort of a thing. All right, go take the city. No. I've got some very clear things that ye shall do that I want to see happen there. And those, that it's not just your worship, but until your worship is coupled with obedience, you won't have it. How many times is it we can come to church, the Lord speaks to us, something there that we know He wants us to do. But like James says, we're such interesting people, He says, how many of you, you behold yourself in a mirror and then when you walk away, you forget what manner of man you saw? 
Sometimes we sit before the Lord and He speaks to us something and says, here's what I want you to do. And we think, oh, that's great. By the time we're in our car, it's over. We saw something, but then we walk away and forget what the thing is that the Lord maybe spoke to us about. I certainly have that problem. I do. Many, many times I look back in my life at how things are, but for one reason or another, one excuse for another, maybe I just let it go. Didn't respond as I knew I should have. It's interesting. This is what kept the children of Israel out for 40 years. They wouldn't do what they were told. Now God is telling Joshua, you want to get that land. You were going, you're going to do what I'm telling you. You want this fullness. You want this for your marriage, for your home, for your children. You want this joy. You want this, this happiness. Well, something of you has to die, and more of me has to come in. That's the formula for joy and victory and fullness in your life. You want the territory? There's a cost. It's what it's going to be, and they wouldn't pay it. Forty years earlier, and it's interesting, in chapter 2, when now Joshua, they're coming into the land, Joshua sends some spies to go into Jericho. Check it out. What do we got to do? Well, the spies go in. Well, they, they, they're seen, and word gets out. There's some Israelites here. They're spying out the city. Well, they go, oh, no, what are we going to do? They start hunting for them. Look all around. There, because of this, a harlot named Rahab takes them, hides them in her house while they're looking for them. So they can't find him. She then has the most interesting conversation in Joshua 2. It says in verse 9, Rahab, the harlot, she said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land, they faint because of you. For we have heard on how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you, and when you came out of Egypt, and what you did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Shihon and Og, whom he utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and earth below. She looks at them, all of us. You're afraid of us? You are afraid of Jericho? As soon as we heard God's hand was upon you and you were his children and he was your Lord and he was leading you, we knew we were done for. Neither did there remain any courage in the heart of any man. We've been scared to death for 40 years of you. Where you been? <laughs> Where you been? I'll tell you, we laugh at that, but I'll t I, I, sometimes I stand before the Lord and thinking he looks at me and wants to say, where you been, Don? All the things that I wanted to do that I still want to do and I want to help you with and stuff, where you been? Everything, all the, every blessing is there. There's nothing I'll ever withhold from you. And yet somehow or another, you still need a word from me. You still, you know, there's so much land, so much territory to take. That's true of all of us. Maybe some of us today, the Lord would look at you and say, all your the things for your life, your home, your marriage, your family, your children, everything all around you, your fullness, your joy, your peace. Where you been? Got every bit of it for you, Nothing will be withheld from you if you'll trust me. But here, you know, we sometimes we know the power of worship, but until it's obeyed, until we can, you know, but the Lord, he wants obedience. The Bible says to obey is better than to sacrifice. God says, I want you to obey me. I want you to obey me. And I think there, that's something. In fact, you know something? I want to do a little test. This is just for the fun of it. This is between me and you. Nobody up there particularly there, but I want you to say something just for the fun of saying it, not to anybody else, just to say it. Open your mouth and say it. Uh, I'm sorry. On three. One, two, three. I'm sorry. Awesome. <laughs> I just was weird. That, that had nothing to do with anything. I just wanted to hear. But it could be that the Lord would want today to say, I want you then when you're leaving, I want you to turn to your husband. I want you to turn to your wife. I want you to turn to your child. I want you to look in their eye and I want you to say, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I should not have done that. It hurts. Forgive me. Oh, it's easy maybe just to say something to the air. But when God, what, what the powerful thing is when we obey in truth, reality. Look at it. That's what sets somebody free. And I'll tell you, I have, the big, I, I have a problem with that. When we got married, I, I had to be right. 
had to be right in everything. And my, my wife, very smart woman, got a college degree, grew up knowing the Lord really, really, really well. I would, got saved when I was a junior in college, far more mature than me, in every way evaluated it, but I had to be right. And so I'd go do something. She'd say, why are you doing that? Well, <laughs> because I'm the leader. Now you just get in your place and follow and you'll be fine. You know, or something. Well, what do you, why did you, well, what do you think? No. And then, she, even if she came up with a better idea, which was most of the time. But the, <laughs> I'd say, no, well, I have, I, I, because I, if, if I bend to this, I'll lose my place as commander in chief, you know, or something. You know, and then, and, and then when you find out you're wrong or you get into things, you know, I, it was so hard for me to come and say, I'm sorry. I, a long time, true story, I would look at her. And my way of saying this, I say, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, what happened. And I want you to know, I forgive you. <laughs> and she would get a smile. She somehow or another was so gracious, she would say, that is so sweet of you. Thank you. You know, and it, was, it took me a long time before I could just simply say, I was wrong. You know, I mean, the older you get, I mean, you've not, you know, for the first years, you've got to be right in everything. Finally, you get to a certain age, anybody got an idea? <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to be right anymore. I just want to survive, you know, or something. But, but early on, the things, we, the holes we dig ourselves to get into. But here, Joshua, now God tells him, now, get this, get this. This is so critical. Joshua was told, I want you now, not only what we has transpired between you and me here, I want you to take the men of war, all of them. And I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant and the priests, and they are going to go right up against the walls of the city of Jericho on the outside, and you are going to walk around it, all of you. In chapter 10, 6, verse 10, he says, no shouting, no noise, and not a word will come out of your mouth. He says, I want you to look at that ark, follow the priest, go around this massive city where the walls thereof, they say on the top of it, chariots road, this massive thing like they had never been around, the biggest enemy they'd ever faced. I want you now just to, without a word, silently, you're going to walk right around that. You'd think, say what? And be quiet. Don't open your mouth. Don't say a word. Keep your eyes fixed. Can you imagine how frightening it is? Joshua, you've got to be kidding us. No. That's what the Lord told me. That's what we got to do. Joshua, we'll, they'll kill us. We'll be sitting ducks. They could just drop anything down. Out there. They, just, just spears, bows, arrows. We're, that, that's certain death. That's what I was told. Could you imagine how hard that was to go around? And not to, get, not to look up, not to, be, not to say a word. I, hey, what, 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 I see one. Hey, they're going to. You know, when they're all looking over, and they get around. They go around that day. Their heart had to be beating. They were, were, just, were dead for sure. They get around the end of the day. How many died? Nobody. Really? Wow. Oh, man. Yeah, we're doing it tomorrow. No. Yeah. Again. The second day, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, a sixth. Here they do it. And then you'll march around a bunch of times at the end. And here, if you can imagine how frightening, their hearts bound, you know, pounding within them in their absolute silence. And you know, all of us, I mean, here on one hand, from a distance, we all want milk and honey. We all want houses we didn't build, wells we didn't dig, olives and vineyards we didn't plant. We still want all the flocks and all the blessings and all these things, but, if this, but we don't want the Jerichos. We don't want God. Look, he says, this, you will find this is more wonderful than the house. This is more wonderful. When you learn to walk around the difficulties and the struggles and the trials of life and you can keep your eyes fixed on me, that will be more wonderful than taking Jericho ultimately. Jericho will be gone one day. You'll have defeated it. It'll be a pile of dust in the past. But you will walk away with something of me you would have never had without Jericho. Without putting your eyes on me. And you know, today, as I said, we all have Jerichos. I don't know what yours is. Might be your marriage, your children. Might be your health. 
Might be your career, business. Well, you're out of work. Will you go back to work? Will it open up again? And it's so hard. Sometimes, you know, it's it, 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 it within us not to, to look, not to be focused. But my finances or my, the marriage or this, whatever it is. And here, but to go through it. We look here at the political world, the social world, the, you know, the, everything going on in the, in the world now. But to keep our eyes on Jesus. To say, Lord, my eyes are on everything else but you. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't know how to solve this. And you know, we're all sinners. I assume you know that. In fact, you did another little test. You know, I'm leaving. I don't care what you think of me. But the, just for the fun of it, if you would just admit, you know something, I'm a sinner and I know it. Would you just raise your hand? I'm a sinner. I'm, well, most of you. I see a couple perfect people here. That's wonderful. <laughs> Variety. The, uh, in fact, even another. How many of you would say more than that? I'm a big sinner. Okay. Not quite as many, but all right. The, uh, but here, the interesting thing is, is, is that the thing I've noticed about myself, and I think everybody, on one hand, we, I, we all say, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And we, I'm a big sinner. But the interesting thing is, is that many times when I would say, okay, just today, tell me just one sin. Just one. That's all I would ask of you today. Don't give me an answer on this one. I don't want to, but ask yourself, Lord, I'm here. Is there one sin in my life you want to talk to me about? One area I'm not trusting you. Something here that you would have for me that you want me to lift up to you. You know, maybe some of you, you're an angry person. You're bitter. You know, you, uh, some of you, I mean, we're getting older. You get, oh, I mean, next thing you know, you get weak. Your body's not, you're, you get, you've got pains. And you get, why has this happened? I can't, I bend over, I can't get back up. This is not working. I can't see so well. I can't hear so well. You know, one of the things I'm kind of grateful for, I actually started having issues going my life years ago. 1996, what's that, 24 years ago, I had a stroke. Lost the functional vision in my right eye. Then a few years after that, I had a lung removed. Long story, no use getting in that. Then a little after that, I had a hip replaced. Then the other one went, and I had to have that replaced. This last year, I had both knees replaced. Four months ago, I had a shoulder replaced. Both elbows have got to go, and the I, arthritis throughout my body. I'm a mess. Fortunately, I, I still look awesome. <laughs> but, the, uh, <laughs> but the thing is in life, when we look there, are we angry? Are we upset? Look what's happening to life around me. What's, you know, or my home or my life or my finances or whatever else. You know, but when there's something there, you know, some of people, they've just been angry for years or bitter for years. Maybe some of you just, am I an angry person? Any of you wake up grumpy? I'm not asking, you don't have to do it. Any, any of you wake up grumpy? I, I used to. Now I just let her sleep, frankly. But the... Uh, <laughs> It's a joke. You can use it. But the, but the thing is in life, when we look around and we realize, God, you're greater than all of these things. That's my theology. Is it my experience? When I first got saved, I was, I was a junior in college, and I had a job. I had a job with United Parcel Service, a part-time driver. And here I am working there, and uh, there was a fellow there named Harold. He was a driver as well. And this Harold, he was an incredible Christian man. He had a son that was very, very severely deformed. And no doubt, I mean, that child would be with them all of their life. And, uh, he had, and they weren't wealthy, and the insurance covered some of these things. But his wife had a car that she would drive during the day, you know what I mean, things. But then he had this old Studebaker. Some of you remember Studebaker. But it didn't, the starter didn't work on the thing very well. And, see, and they lived on a hill. He would park his hill, as the car there, he just used it going back and forth to work. When he came to work, he parked on a hill and he would just, you know, let the brake off, go down, put it in gear, pop the clutch, and drive to work. Well, the United Parcel Service was on level ground. And so when he went home, he would go and a bunch of guys there would go out and we'd push his car. He'd, and, but he was always, praise the Lord, he was always talking about Jesus, all the joy and the happiness, and people would just look at this guy. What makes him tick? 
We'd, you know, it push his car, pop the clutch, the engine started, he'd wave off, God bless you guys, praise Jesus, you know, and everybody think, what is it with this guy? One day I'm in the locker room changing in my uniform and I think I'm alone or something, and I was upset about something, I kind of slammed my locker. I turned around, there's Harold standing there with a big smile on his face. And I looked at him and I said, oh, Harold. I said, I'll, I'll bet you wonder if I'm even a Christian. He smiled. He says, oh, no, no. Don, you're, as, you're a Christian. You're as born again as I am. You and I were both on the same plane. We're both going to the same place. He says, however, there is one little difference. He said, I'm going first class. You're going economy. <laughs> Never forgot that. And I found victory. I found something greater than all of these things. And you know, when somebody looks there and realizes that God looks at us, here the thing that then happens, we got all these things around us in the world today. And anybody in God's will, if you're in God's will, there's a Jericho. There's unconquered territory within your life. Unconquered issues of which Jesus said, believe me, if you'll trust me, this will pass the struggle. But you will pass the, the, the tension, the stress. But if you will trust me through this, one day this will be in your rearview mirror. But you and I will be deeper, closer. Your joy, your fullness will be greater. You will win. And you know, when we would look at our life, I don't know maybe where you're at today and what's going on within it. But whatever it is, maybe as we close, we're going to pray in a moment, but you just need to say, Jesus, I do trust you. I cannot handle this. Please forgive me. Please help me. And then, what do you want me to do? What saith my Lord to his servant? Can you say that to yourself? Can you do that? Can you actually ask him as we close to say, what... What do you want me to say? It'll probably take everything within me to do it and to say it as simple humanly as it is to give the advice to somebody else, but now to take it myself and to do it. I'll tell you, I promise you, if you do it, the walls will fall down. You will look back here, the children of Israel. I think the first day they went around there, their heart was beating. They were scared to death. And, you know, and, the, and the second day, they're still, wow, we're alive. Third day, it gets a little better. He says, the seventh day when you go around, I want you to let out with a great shout. The first day, they couldn't have shouted. It would have been a whimper. <laughs> you know, second day, wow, we're alive. Third day, I wonder what's happening. Fourth day, he might give us the city. The fifth day. There may be things in your life right now that you want blessing for, and God may say, you know something, I want you to rock, walk around it and be quiet. And I want you to get up tomorrow and march around it again in your heart. I want you to pray and be quiet. God, fix my husband, fix my wife, fix my kids. And tomorrow you wake up, they're not fixed. He says, be quiet. Don't utter a word to anybody. Just go pray about it. March around it together, and let's talk about it there. And then do it again. you got to do it the next day, then do it the next day, and then do it the next day. And then one day you'll actually you'll find the issue isn't did they change at all. The issue will be did you change? The issue will be did something happen within you? And in God's time, he'll deal with them. And when you realize, Lord, you're sneaky. <laughs> you're really kind of sneaky the way you put this stuff right in front of us. Let us get scared to death. Until something in our heart grabs onto you, puts our eyes on you. In the midst of the trial, right below the, eyes, uh, the eyesight of the enemy. And give me victory. 